Hey guys, welcome back to my Ron Paul curriculum vlog, week four. I've been so alone ever since I left the tribe. That's just how it goes, guess I like the lonely vibe. So, I should have actually recorded this last week on Sunday, but I didn't because we were getting prepared for a very long and big feast. Um, part of uh, a Jewish tradition that we celebrate uh, called Sukkot. You may have, you may or may not have heard of it, uh, but it's called Sukkot. It's eight days long, and we had to prepare for it, which is the first and last day of the eight days. We have a feast at our park, so we had to prepare meals and get everything ready. We had to build a big structure outside, which is also part of the uh, part of the uh, holiday. <coughs> So, that's why I didn't get to record this last week, so I'm recording it today. Uh, even though it's not Sunday. So, let me start with English. In English, I finally finished uh, Jim Lehrer's book, A Buffs of My Own. And it's a pretty good book. I like it a lot, and I'm actually going to read it again just to gather more points that I might have missed. Because it's always good to do that, just in case you did. Uh, so, um... I'm going to get started on writing more notes and tracking down my life, uh, writing down my life, um, creating notes and things about what I do, so I'll be able to write an autobiography when I get older, possibly, if I've ever completed anything very uh, sufficient to our world or anything sufficient to me, like if I become famous for anything, then I'll definitely have to write an autobiography. Also. I finally finished my first 500 word writing assignment, which uh, required me to write three stories that I would possibly include in my own autobiography. So I posted that on my blog, you can check that out, that out if you want. And I also um, was assigned another 500 word writing assignment, which requires me to write about a specific story or a specific event that Jim Lehrer wrote in his own autobiography. or. Uh, I could skim a chapter that I really liked, and I could write notes down about it, and I could write in my essay why I like that chapter, and what stuck out to me. So in physics, I'm taking physical science, and I'm studying about different um, forces. Like, I learned about the universal gravitational force, which is a very, very small number. Um, I'm gonna pause the video real quick and get my notes so I can so I can recite these correctly. Okay, so I got my notes right here, and uh, the first thing I learned about uh, gravitational forces in a more complex manner than what I've been learning before, which is just 9.81 meters per second squared, I learned about Newton's law of gravity that he created. Um, so I'm gonna recite that to you right now. Every particle in the universe attracts every other particle in the universe with a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square distance between them. So that is Newton law, Newton's law of gravity. Um, and I, wrote, I did a diagram of the forces between bodies. So there's a picture, you want to see it? There's a picture of the sun cooling on the earth. In the earth pulling on the sun. But there is one question. Which force is greater? The answer is neither. For every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So neither of the forces are greater. They're both pulling at the same amount. Uh, Newton's law of gravity. Math mathematical expression is uh, right here. I'm going to read it. Force is equal to uh, the gravitational, the universal, universal gravitational constant times the mass of the first body and the mass of the second body. So just multiply all those together. Then all that is divided by uh, the distance between the two centers, between the two centers of the bodies, squared. So the mathematical expression said in speech is Force is equal to the gravitational constant times mass 1 times mass 2, all divided by uh, distance between the two bodies squared. 
um, the the uh, universal universal gravitational constant or g is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 uh, newtons times meters uh, divided by kilograms squared newtons times meters squared uh, divided by kilograms squared so that is a very very small number in fact I think I might have actually written it down here yeah so this is going to be a while. It's equal to 0, 0.00000. I did my first equation, which is uh, the amount of gravitational force in between the Earth and the Sun. So uh, the Earth's mass is 5.972 times 10 to the 24th. That is a very big number. But you know what's bigger? The Sun. 1.989 times 10 to the 30th. So that is very, very big. It's a lot bigger than here. A lot, a lot heavier than here. So uh, these are these are the numbers right here. You can just read them if you want. They are very, very big numbers. Uh, so the equation would go like this: um, force is equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons uh, times meters squared divided by kilograms squared times 5.972 uh, times 10 to the 24th kilograms times 1.989 times 10 to the 30th uh, kilograms all divided by the distance between the sun and the earth now the distance between the sun and the earth is 1.496 times 10 to the 11th meters and that's also very big but not nearly as big as the masses uh, so you just do that divided by do this Divided by that squared, and then you just calculate it out, and then my answer that I got, which is the gravitational pull, is that number right there. I'm not going to say that out because that's a very, very big number. So it's that many newtons of force between the two objects. And then I also learned about drag. Um, like wind resistance, which is also drag. Um, so, and I and I also did why objects accelerate at the same rate. The reason for that is because of the drag and the inertia. The inertia and the drag um, balance each other out. So double the mass, double the force, but double the inertia. And doesn't want to stop moving, but the drag is keeping it at the same rate. So bigger the mass. Uh, bigger the force, but also bigger the air drag, which keeps it at the same rate. And then more on drag. Wind, wind resistance is also drag, and drag increases as velocity increases. The total amount of drag matters on the size of the front of the object, and that means bigger surface area of the front of the object, the more air resistance there's going to be because of how flat and how big it is. It's going to add more air to the surface and it's going to keep it from going faster. Terminal velocity. Um, so, an object reaches terminal velocity when the force of drag from the atmosphere on it is equal to the force of gravity, so that there's no longer a net force on it. And I haven't learned all about that yet, that's still kind of a complex subject. In fact, that the bounds of that goes way beyond what I'm learning right now. I won't learn that for like another grade or so. And maybe I will learn in this grade just very far from here. Um, uh, that was what I learned in physics in week four. I kind of did a really deep explanation on that, a lot deeper than English because English isn't as complex as physics. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and move on to Algebra 2 now, math, ninth grade. In Algebra 2, I learned about operations and functions. So we have, you can add two functions together, you can, mul you can uh, not multiply, subtract, subtract two functions together, you can multiply two functions together, and you can divide two functions together. Now, there are certain domains with um, operations and functions, because you can't just do anything. There are, there are domains that you can specify uh, which type, which um, values can be that which values can exist, which inputs can exist. Now, for every single function, for every single, you can't see that. 
for every single fun for every single uh, function, I'm gonna turn that. For every single function, uh, there's one domain that always exists for each function. It's A intersect B. Um, but if you're gonna be dividing, then there's another domain. Uh, that domain is uh, g of x cannot equal zero. If you're dividing f by g, g cannot g of x cannot be zero because you cannot divide by zero. Because if you divide by zero, it'll be an undefined value, and we don't want that. And then I also learned about the composition of functions. Uh, composition of functions. Uh, let, let me see. Composition of functions is uh, when you put two functions together, basically, when you calculate them together. So f of g of x, when you use another function of the input of a different function, that is composition of functions. So let's say we have f of x, and x is equal to g of x. g of x is the input of that function. So think of it like this. Think of a function as a machine that when you input a value, it calculates that value through a certain equation and then pops out a different value based on the equation that it calculated. So a uh, composition of a function would look like this. f of g of x or f of g would look like that. f with a little circle in the middle. It's like a degree sign. It's like the degree sign, but it's, it's in the middle of the line. Um, so this right here is called a composite function, f of g. It's called a composite function. And then you can do as many functions as you want. So f of g of h, right there. Put that close to f of g of h. Just be f of g of h of x. Okay, so let's say f of x is equal to the square root of x, and g of x is equal to the square root of 2 minus x. That means f of g would be f of uh, the square root of 2 minus x, which is then equal to the square root of the square root of 2 minus x, which is then e equal to the fourth root, let me get that closer, the fourth root of 2 minus x, which is then equal to the square root of g of x, which actually is just really simple. So the, the cube root, not the cube root, the, the fourth root, let me get that closer again, fourth root of 2 minus x, that's the final answer, which can also be translated into the square root of g, minus, of g of x. Uh, the domain of this, the domain of g, is uh, in, in in equality notation. It would be uh, negative, uh, let's see, 2 minus x is greater than 0. But that can only be true if x is uh, less than or equal to 2. And then um, interval notation is uh, negative infinity and 2 inclusive. So this is the domain of, of g of x. And then if we wanted to do g of f, we do the opposite process, so g of f. Then translate, translate into g um, of the square root of x, which is then equal to uh, the square root of 2 minus the square root, square root of x. Right there. And then the domain of this, I'm going to skip here. Just skip all the domain process because I showed you last time. So the domain of this is uh, 0 and 4, all inclusive. The brackets mean all inclusive. And that's what I learned in math in week 4. Now, uh, I mean, that's pretty much it. I didn't really learn that much in public public speaking. I just got a few more tips, a few more tips to implement into my speeches when I talk or when I ha actually make a speech or presentation to anybody like you, like my viewers, if you're viewing. So that is a review of week four, Ron Paul curriculum. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, like and subscribe if you like my vlogs, and I'll see you next time.